The reality of decorating is that it may seem simple, but it's so easy to get overwhelmed by choice. For me, the first step in decorating any room is creating a brand, like kind of a roadmap, a North Star to refer back to. In a world of endless choices, you kind of need a guidebook to remind you of your goal and strategy, and that is where branding comes in. I'll try and make sense of it. Glamour equals swagger. <laughs> Good design can be transformative. I got this. So, how do you start? The key to coming up with a brand is to do an honest inventory of who you are, but always, always with an eye towards who you want to be. Creating your brand is an opportunity for self-improvement, not in an abstract way, but like in a tangible way to help you move your goals forward. Your brand can help make you your best self. A brand is a way to create an identity. In the past, branding was the way that companies identified and advertised their products. So you'd recognize them as different from the rest and by their version of soda, dishwashing detergent, or clothing. So that's branding from the past, but now branding has become a far wider reaching concept that applies not just to business, but to everyone. The idea of having a personal brand helps other people know who you are and what you stand for. And you can do this in design too. A personal brand gives you the opportunity to steer your design in the right direction. About 25 years ago, Simon told me about this new book. I think it was called Brand You. And he's like, oh, everyone's talking about how you have to have, like, your own brand. And I was like, wait, a brand? Isn't that, like, cereal that you get on the shelf or a soda or whatever? Like, I'd never heard of it. And he said, no, no, no. It's this new thing where you, like, have to come up with your own personal brand. And at the time, it seemed absurd and quite arrogant. Cut to today when everything is a brand. I'm a brand, you're a brand, he's a brand, she's a brand. We're all brands. I want to help you figure out what your brand is. To create your brand, start by inventing a three-word branding guide. The first word should be an adjective that describes like a personal trait. Like, are you sporty? Are you preppy? Are you luxurious, flamboyant, fresh? The second word in your brand should create kind of an environmental vibe. So are you coastal, Palm Beach, like farmhouse, Scandinavian, traditional? Hollywood glam, Southwestern, French country, Mediterranean. And the third word or phrase should be an occupation or lifestyle. You can choose this occupation or identity from the reality of your life or, better yet, um, who you want to be. So socialite, gallerist, fashionista, yoga mom, sailor. When you put these three words together, you can create a personal brand that will be a guide as you make any and all decorating decisions. Here are a few brands I've made already. So you might be a fun-loving East Coast sailor, a well-read Scandinavian barista, or how about a fun-loving desert homesteader, or an elegant New Orleans dancer. Yeah, I mean, they're all like, they're kind of wild, but like I say them and you get it. And that's what a brand should be. You should hear the words and be like, oh, I get that. Branding is a serious business, like for reals. So you cannot stray too far. However, you should also feel free to get a little creative with some of the words you choose. I'm a big fan of the portmanteau word, the combination of two words. I think the word that most accurately describes me is hangry. Because I'm always hungry, I'm always a little bit angry, and hangry is a perfect portmanteau word. So if you're feeling constrained by the three-word branding edict, feel free to try to create your own portmanteau word for one of the words. A modern hippie could be a mippy. Mine are usually very um, obscene. <laughs> and let's talk about my brand and my journey from being a potter to being the amazing home lifestyle entrepreneur magician you see before you today. Um, when I started my career as a potter, which happened quite by accident, I was unemployed and I was making pots and my parents were like, we're not giving you any more money. So you either sell a pot or you get a job. And I was 27 and broke and I sold a pot and I was selling my pottery to Barney's and I was just so in the moment. And I was making these kind of 
cool, groovy, striped parts that were very clean and modern and minimal. And for a few years, I just was like in it. And I just kept making pots. I was working like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, making pots. And when I finally had a chance to kind of breathe and come up for air, I started to think about what I was saying with my pots. Like I was making these cool, stripey pots. And there was the visual vocabulary of what I was saying. But I also thought to myself, the pots that I'm making also have meaning. Like I'm communicating something conceptual. And I and I thought to myself, what am I saying with my pottery? And I thought, well, my pottery is modern. It's really about creating new, innovative, modern design with a nod to the notion of modernism. So it's definitely modern. And I also thought, you know, my work is very much rooted in America. Like, I am inspired by and part of the tradition of American design, which I think is reflective of what I think of America as being, which is a country of optimism and possibility. So I I think and I hope that in my work, I was making pottery that was modern, that was American in its spirit of optimism and possibility. And I thought, my pottery is glamorous. I thought, wow, that's kind of what my pottery is. It's modern American glamour. And that was a revelatory moment for me. Because once I kind of realized what I was saying with my work, that I was creating pottery that communicated the idea of modern American glamour, it kind of gave me permission to apply that very same ethos to myriad categories. And so it it was a real like light bulb moment for me. I thought, well, you know, if I'm making these pots that are about modern American glamour, like, I could do the same thing with pillows. So I thought, yeah, I can do pillows as long as they refer back to that idea of what I'm trying to communicate with my work. And, you know, that that was something that I realized 25 years ago. And I think that even now, as I've become an older and more haggard potter, I'm still saying exactly the same thing with my work, whether it be pillows, pots, furniture, lighting, interior design. They all come back to that same core principle, the brand of my work, modern American glamour. And by creating a brand just with my pottery, something as mundane as pottery, that very ethos that I created is able to translate to all of the products and things that I surround myself with today. It all refers back to the big bang of my brand, my revelation that I was communicating modern American glamour. So having my three-word brand as a guidepost has really led me through my entire design career. I always refer back to it. So I really mean it. When you are thinking about designing your own home, it really helps to try to figure out exactly what you want to communicate. And it is a process of contemplation and taking true inventory And might even seem silly, but it's so worth it in the end because if you have your three-word brand as a guidepost and you always can refer back to it, you you can figure out whether you're straying from your vision or not. And you probably are going to want to stick true to your original vision. So come up with your three-word brand. It's worth it. The truth is when I started out as a potter, it never in a million years crossed my mind that I was creating a brand, that I was creating a company, that I was doing anything other than just being in the moment and making pots. So the fact that my world, my work, and my life has evolved to encompass this business um, is a complete shock and surprise. It's a very, very happy accident. Um, There's been a lot of mishigas along the way, but in the end, I think it's been worth it. There's been a lot of mishigas, but it's been worth it. So you can find inspiration from branding really from any creative field. And a design muse, like an actual interior designer muse of mine who had an incredible sense of branding is Mario Boita. So he's the antithesis of what you actually do, but you're saying he's inspiring to you just because of his commitment to his yes. vision. Yes. Mario Bata had such a sense of clarity, and his three-word brand was so simple. Mario Bata was the prince of chintz, and that's exactly who he was. Now, 
chintz is like a glazed cotton fabric that feels sort of very socialite Upper East Side and is typically printed with flowers. So it's sort of a very like girly, ladylike flower. Very they, 80s. Yeah, it's like a very girly, ladylike flowery, kind of very 80s y Laura Ashley ish look. And Mario Botta took the idea of chintz and just went with it. Yes, um, that's surprising to me that you name him because he's the antithesis of you, but I guess that's why he's, he got your attention. I think a great brand is something you just know it when you see it. And, you know, yeah, Mario Botta really was very, very different for me, but I have such respect for what he accomplished and his complete clarity of vision and his full-on commitment to floral chintz. <laughs> and a Mario Botta room was like chintz on chintz on chintz on chintz on chintz on chintz. On chintz on chintz with a poodle on top. (laughs) In the world of fashion, one of my favorite brands is Tom Brown. I think Tom Brown, the iconic menswear designer, has such a clear, simple, and rigorous point of view and approach to design and always had, and always has had that since he began. How would you define Tom Brown's design style and brand? Well, he's associated with grey, he's associated with white stripes. It's very rigorous, almost like a military uniform, his menswear. In his couture women's wear, he plays a lot with a broader canvas. The reason that you find Tom Brown to be a noteworthy brand is because he's had such conviction about this palette, this limited palette, and this rigorous approach to design. Yeah, and I think that you can take inspiration from Tom Brown because he doesn't get distracted. Like, he's somebody who conceived of his brand, and though I'm sure he's confronted with a billion influences and inspirations, I'm sure he's tempted to stray a million times, but he is co-mitted. And um, I really respect his ability to tune out the noise and execute exactly what he wants to execute. And I think there's a lot to learn from that idea when you think about how to design your own home. I think the key to a good brand or a good branding exercise is to think about people who, when you imagine them, you know exactly what you're going to get. And I think an unexpected example of that is the filmmaker M. Night Shyamalan, who first kind of came to our attention with The Sixth Sense. And an M. Night Shyamalan movie, you know exactly what you're going to get. It's going to be kind of scary. It's going to be a little, like, intellectual. And there's going to be some freaky surprise. And his consistency of vision has made him a totally recognizable, identifiable, and probably most importantly, bankable brand. And, um, yeah, what do you think about that? (laughs) I'm thinking of other directors who have that. I guess Federico Fellini, you know what you're going to get, La Dolce Vita, Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. The Fast and the Furious, you know what you're going to get. You're basically talking about committing, commitment. Yeah, and I think, I think the Fast and Furious is a perfect idea of a franchise that is just like doing slight, ever so slight evolutions of an idea. And I think that's what a really good brand is. It establishes itself and then just sticks to its guns. I think the key to a, a good branding expert is the idea of simplicity and communication so that the second somebody sees what you're selling, whether it's a movie, art, fashion, architecture, they know what they're looking at. They understand what you're trying to communicate. And I think the king of branding is Milton Glaser, who has come up with some iconic slogans and logos that are that are so simple and pared down and like you see them, you know them, and he's kind of the gold standard, Milton Glaser. Like when I think of Milton Glaser, I think of I love New York, I heart and why. Like it's incredible, it's genius. And it's sort of, funnily enough, I actually think it's just a riff on Robert Indiana's iconic love. Like he took the idea of that and just kind of twisted it. You know what it is, you know it when you see it. Well, Milton Glaser worked at a time when brands were Coca-Cola, um, you know, Kellogg's. Yeah, Kellogg's, Campbell's Soup. So he works on that period where those were brands. Now, of course, we use the term branding in a much broader sense, but I think he's still inspirational to anybody who's working on their brand. Yeah, I think, I think you can take lessons from all of these iconic brandsters um, to help create your own personal brand in your self, in your fashion, and for our purposes, your home. Yeah. 
So once you create your three word brand, you need to use it to guide every part of your design. Your whole design should refer back to your three word brand. So when designing my shelter island home, my three words were eccentric, coastal, and rich hippie or rippy. And I think you can see my eccentric, coastal, rippy vibe in each and every move I made in that house. So let's break it down. Eccentric. I would say that a 12 foot tall macrame owl is eccentric. Coastal is really determined by location. And I think that's a very important thing is to, to give your design a sense of place. I am very lucky to have a house that's right on the sea and I wanted it to feel coastal and everything that entails. To me, coastal is casual. It's a feeling of indoor, outdoor, and it's about the sea. And I think my house feels coastal. And I guess the last word, rippy, rich hippie, uh, is kind of about um, the fact that a lot of the, the materials in my house are very like natural, a little bit global. It's about, you know, custom tiles and wood ceilings. It's about sort of an honest but luxurious sense of material. So I think everywhere you look, you kind of see that you're in an eccentric, coastal, rippy space. Another example of a brand that I did for for my bestie when I designed her house in Florida, I could very easily sum up exactly who she is. She is flamboyant, aka bold, glamorous, and confident. Palm Beach, which is both a place and a state of mind and happens to perfectly capture my client and friend. And fashionista, because she is a fashionista. And fashionista is another one of those words that really is it's a, a job and a state of mind. Um, and her house is exactly it. It is flamboyant, bold, colorful. It couldn't be Palm Beachier. And you know the second you walk into that house that you are in the house of a fashion maven. Flamboyant, Palm Beach, fashionista, voila. So those, those examples of branding are really uh, based in reality. You know, my, my house needed to be a reflection of me. Uh, my friend's house needed to be a reflection of her. But if you want to make the varsity move... And I encourage you to do just that. Um, you can create a character. So instead of making the house exactly who you are, you can really create a fantasy. And I'll give you an example of of a time I did that um, when I designed the uh, when I designed the Parker Palm Springs Hotel. Um, I invented a fictional muse who I called Mrs. Parker, um, and Mrs. Parker uh, she didn't exist IRL. But Mrs. Parker, in my mind, was a free-spirited, glamorous socialite. And the hotel that we created, I imagine, was Mrs. Parker's estate. And every square inch of that hotel is definitely the space of a free-spirited, glamorous socialite. I knew that she was a world traveler. So we filled the hotel with all the things she bought in her free-spirited travels around the world. I think her free-spirited self um, can be seen in the fact that there's a real global feel. It feels like the home of a jet setter who just sort of traveled the world and collected things willy-nilly and brought them home because she loved them and she knew they would work. It's a varsity move to create a character as your fictional occupant of your house, but why not? Why be constrained by who you are? Why not be who you fantasize about being? Don't you want to be a free-spirited, glamorous socialite? I know I do. When doing the Parker Hotel, um, which took years, we spent so many hours in meetings saying like, well, what would Mrs. Parker do? Would Mrs. Parker have that? Would Mrs. Parker have this? And when it came time to actually design the the, uh, restaurant in the hotel, I was so sick, so sick of hearing about this inspirational, fabulous Mrs. Parker that I imagined, well, I wonder who Mr. Parker is. Um, And we decided to make the restaurant, which is called Mr. Parker's, a reflection of Mr. Parker's brand. And Mr. Parker, in my mind, was a louche, clubby, degenerate. Um, And I think those words are probably all kind of the same, which is fine because that's just who Mr. Parker is. And the resulting space, which is really hedonistic and decadent, you can only imagine the debauchery that would go on shame Mr. Parker. And... um, Yeah, Mr. Parker's. It's fantastic. Go check it out when you're in Palm Springs. Mrs. Parker, the muse for the entire Parker Palm Springs Hotel, um, really has a distinct character. And I felt totally 
free to break from character in this one space in the hotel, uh, Mr. Parker's, because Mr. Parker is his own man. Um, and it's it's really a cool juxtaposition between these two spaces. So I guess the takeaway for you is that not your entire house has to conform to the exact same brand. Like you can kind of tweak and evolve the brand room by room if you want to. Um, but there should be some relationship between the different rooms and brands in your house. The socialite part is quite evident. Mrs. Parker is a popular and um, rich and luxurious lady. But I think the most important word, and it's a very important word to discuss, is glamorous. And glamour is a very, very strange word. It's a word that's thrown about constantly. Um, And I think it's really, really hard to define. But I have my own definition of glamour. To me, glamour is about confidence. It's about not caring what other people think. If I had to come up with a synonym for glamour, I would say the word is swagger. Glamour equals swagger. And we should all aspire to swagger. The varsity move is to create a character. But I think you're I think you're more than just a varsity player. I think you could be a super varsity player and I think the super varsity move is to take a fictitious character and put them in a location. So I my forever muse is Jackie O. I mean she was the epitome of glamour. And sometimes in my mind's eye I think, well what if Jackie O was in Big Sur? How do I combine the sort of the rustic natural beauty of Big Sur with the international glamorous socialite status of Jackie O. And I find that by combining those two disparate spirits, a sense of dynamism and creativity can erupt. So go super varsity, take a fictitious character, plop her into a fabulous location and watch explosive creativity unfurl. When I'm not daydreaming about sending Jackie O to different glamorous locales and the um, the glamour that wouldn't sue, I'm also often thinking of Andy Warhol, my other forever muse, the king of pop style and cultural wisdom and kind of just the king of everything. Like, I don't know if I can get through a minute of any day without thinking about Andy Warhol. And so sometimes I think like, all right, why don't I send Andy Warhol to London? What would he do? How would he essentialize the English spirit and reflect it back in the same way he did the spirit of America? When I think about Andy Warhol, I think about how he took mundane objects and celebrated them and made them iconic and monumental. Think about the soup can. Um, and when I think about London, in at least in my mind's eye, I think about historicism. I think about the John Soane Museum, which you guys really need to check out because that John Soane knew how to arrange an object, believe me. And I think it would be really exciting and interesting to see how Andy Warhol would take a mundane English object um, and put it on a pedestal. So, yeah, Andy Warhol in London kind of gets my gears going. My overarching philosophy about design is that design at its best, whether I'm making an object or creating a room, should look completely effortless it should look as if it was just always there, as if it was uncovered rather than created. I think that a good object, just you're like, oh, right, that thing, that looks so familiar, but you have no idea how it happened. You just know that it exists and it needs to exist. Um, And I think that in order to get there requires a lot of effort, unfortunately. Like to get a good design, to design a good room, you just have to think and think and think and work and work and work. But... At the end of the day, if you do the work to define your brand really, really clearly and use that as a guidepost to all of your work, it takes away so much of the guesswork and really leads you to creating a space that looks exactly like it's supposed to be. In terms of effort when designing your room, you shouldn't feel bad if you screw up and need to keep like thinking and reworking on it because I think any creative process really takes a lot of work. You know that famous expression, writing is rewriting? It's really about starting and then stepping back, looking at it analytically, being rigorous and just keeping on going and going and going. So in a funny way, as writing is really rewriting, designing is really redesigning. Just keep at it. Don't be intimidated and just charge forward. Your three-word branding guide will give you a north star so you don't stray too far from your design vision. Keep those three words in mind as you're conceptualizing, shopping, and evaluating your design. You can't stray too far from your brand. 
A dalliance is okay, an affair not so much. You need to marry reality with fantasy. Combine who you are with who you want to be.